you would, turn in your Bibles again to Romans chapter 1 this morning. Romans chapter 1 today. I can imagine what some are thinking, and as we uh, trying to get out of the introduction here, that this rite will be here for 50 years in the book of Romans. <laughs> but I am deliberately spending more time probably in the introduction because you need to have a proper introduction to the book, I think, to really get a view of the whole. And so uh, pray for your patience, but on the other hand, we do not apologize for thoroughly investigating uh, the Word of God and for the Scriptures. I think they deserve uh, thorough investigation. And certainly the book of Romans deserves thorough investigation because, as I said, I believe that Romans is the gospel. It is the gospel. The book of Romans uh, is the proclamation of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly we want to get it right. We want to get squeeze every bit of juice out of as we can, so to speak. <laughs> and so... Uh, I hope and I pray that we do that and that God will be pleased uh, with our examination. Let's begin, read the first seven verses here of the book of Romans, the introduction to the, uh, Paul's gospel or God, Paul's epistle to the Romans. Paul, a bond servant or a bond slave of Jesus Christ, more appropriately termed, called an apostle separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We've already spoken over the first, for the most part, the first two and a half verses, the last two Sundays, uh, spoken on the issue of Paul and his apostleship and his calling him being a slave, really, of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a picture of all of us, that we are all slaves. We are all bought with a price, as the Scripture says. He was called to be an apostle, and the word there that is used, or the sense of it there is used, is one of the original apostles. There were 12 originals, and then he, called by the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he was one of these, we would say, 13 apostles, and after those 13, there are no more. And we spoke about uh, there's a different word used for those 13. And they had a specific purpose and a specific calling and specific gifts that have not been seen uh, in the church since their time. And then he says he was separated to the gospel of God. And, of course, we spoke about that, how that, that was his calling, was the gospel of God, preaching the gospel. And then how all of this transpired, which had been promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And we talked about those prophecies. I'm not going to go back through all of that, but all those prophecies concerning uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Scriptures. The declaration of the gospel in Genesis 3.15. Uh, the picture in Genesis 22 uh, there of uh, the gospel. Uh, Genesis 49 and other places there foretelling the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it said there in the first verse 3, then we talked about this briefly last week, the first part of this, concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And he is emphasizing here that the gospel spoken of in verse 1 is about God's Son. The gospel is about God's Son. It is the message of God's Son. And you take the Lord Jesus Christ out of this and you have no more gospel. There is not a gospel without Christ. Uh, you know, 
Uh, Paul said, if you preach any other gospel to you that, uh, than what I have preached, then that is not a gospel. It's not a gospel. And so without Jesus, there is no gospel, there is no good news. But now we come down here to the latter part of this verse, and we look there, and he says, you know, he says, his son. We didn't really treat that last week, but I really want to treat that somewhat this week. The word that is used here for son is the word weos, H-U-I-O-S, in the Greek. Now, it's a different word. There are word. There's a word that is used for us in our initial salvation that is technon, which is a child of God. In other words, when we are birthed into the kingdom as the children of God, it is that word technon or variations on that particular word. And that means a child. It has to do with a child. But Jesus is never referred to as a technon. He's not a child of God in the sense that he was born into the kingdom of God. He has always been, we us, the son of God. He is the eternal son of God. And the word we us there indicates a relationship, a specific relationship, a relationship that did not begin with his earthly birth, but was from all eternity. He is the eternal we us son of God. And he did not attain this place after birth. There are those religions, those cults that teach that he attained unto deity after his birth, but that's a false doctrine. He had that relationship already. John 17, in verse 5, in his great high priestly prayer, Jesus speaks of that eternal relationship that he had with the Father. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you when? Before the world was. He had that relationship already as the Son of God. In John chapter 1, and there in the first two verses there, in the beginning was the Word. Now we understand that the Word that is spoken here, that is spoken of here, is a, uh, a basically an alliteration or an, a, a synonym here for the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 14 it says, The Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Well, who is he talking? He's not talking about a book that became word and dwelled among us. He's speaking there about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then here in verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word, being Jesus Christ, was with God. And the Word, being Jesus Christ, was God. He was in the beginning with God, God the Father. And so we understand that. And Jesus proclaimed this truth himself to the Jews. Now they didn't like it. They did not accept him as weos, the son of God. They understood when he said that he was God's son. They understood what he was saying, that basically I and God the Father in heaven are of the same essence. We are both deity, and that's what angered them because they did not believe in the deity of Christ. But what made them even angrier was when he said to them in John 8 and 58, Most assuredly or truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was... I am speaking the same words that were spoken out of the burning bush to Moses. And God's saying there, call them and tell them that I am has sent you, the eternal one. And so this Jesus we know and accept and believe to be weos, the son of God, the distinctive only son of God in that sense. We are sons of God in a sense when we, uh, you know, when we are born again, but not in the same sense that Jesus is the Son of God. And it says he was born, this eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord, was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now how can that which is eternal being born, be born with that is a mystery, but is God's good pleasure and God's purpose. This had to be. This was a course of events that had to occur for you and I to have salvation. There had to be a physical sacrifice. When the 
prefiguring of Abraham and Isaac. When Abraham took Isaac on the mount, Isaac said, Father, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide a sacrifice. And in essence, in eternity, God already had the sacrifice. The Lord Jesus Christ, his son. And in time, as when the fullness of time was come, it says in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. And he was born of the Virgin Mary. He became flesh to redeem those that were under the law and under the curse of the law. Which was all of us. We were all under the curse of the law. Declaration of his birth means also here that he was a real man. He really lived. He really suffered. He really died. Jesus was not a figment of imagination. Now there are a lot of, of uh, people in this world that would really like it to be true that Jesus was just some uh, myth. But the reality is that even earthly historians acknowledge the existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Roman historian Tacitus, writing in A.D. 114, says that Jesus was the founder of the Christian religion and was put to death by Pontius Pilate. It's in the Roman record. The noted historian Josephus, who wrote what are called the Antiquities, writing in A.D. 90 wrote an historical account of Jesus and he said this. He said, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man. He was Christ. Those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third days the divine prophets had foretold. Here was an earthly man that acknowledged that Jesus died and was risen again. That he lived, his followers were obedient to him, they followed him, and this was a man that rose again from the dead. And these were men that were not believers, but they wrote historically of the existence and really the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were those that would really love to tear that out of the history of the world. But beyond that is the biblical record of his life here on earth. In Luke, back over in chapter 2 and there in verses 10 and 11, it says, The angel said to them, speaking to the shepherds out in the field, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. In 1 John chapter 1, there in the first two verses there of 1 John chapter 1, John the Apostle writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. The Lord Jesus Christ is who he's speaking of there. Because he goes on in that to say that those that deny that Jesus was born or came in the flesh do not know the Father. He existed in reality. He is not some fairy tale. He existed. You remember after Jesus was resurrected from the dead that we studied not too long ago in Luke and he said in chapter 24 and verses 39 and 40 he said, look here. I've got hands. Touch them. Feel them. I really exist. And he was seen by over 500 witnesses before he went back to be with the Father. All of that is an historical account. All of that proves the existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. It cannot be denied by mankind no matter how bad they would like to. 
But it says he was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. See, this was prophesied that he would be of the line of David. God had promised to David an eternal throne. Well, how could that be? David did not live eternally. David died. How, how could that be? And the nation of Israel at various times ceased. It went into captivity at various times. What did he mean by that? And you look at those promises that he gave to David. In, in 2 Samuel, and we're going to look at some of these Old Testament scriptures, but here is the, the first prediction of this, really, to David. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, in verses 12 and 13, David, and God's covenant with David, and God's speaking here to David, he says, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, how can that be? How can that be? Because he was speaking not simply of a physical kingdom but of a spiritual kingdom. He was speaking of that one that would come, the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know this? Look at Psalm 89. And there in verses 3 and 4. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne. What? To all generations. And then the little word there at the end, selah, means think about that, basically. Think about that. How can that be? I will establish it forever and build your throne to all generations. He's not talking about a physical throne there. He is talking about a spiritual throne and a spiritual kingdom that shall be established forever. But down through the line of David. In verse 29 of that same psalm, he said, His seed also I will make to endure forever his throne as the days of heaven. Huh. Well, that's eternal. In verse 36 of that same psalm, he said, His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It's an eternal kingdom shall be established through the line of David. That was what he had established. That was what he said. And in, in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, generally these verses are only read right around Christmas time, but a great prophecy here. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And that prophecy was fulfilled in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and the building of this kingdom is going on even now as we speak today. God is doing that. He said, my zeal will perform it. I will do this. It is going to happen. Now, was this fulfilled that he was of the line of David? Absolutely. The fact that Jesus was of this line was literally fulfilled and that both Mary, his mother, as found in Luke chapter 3, and I'm not going to go back to all of that. You can go back through there and read that in uh, the genealogy there, verse 23 on down from that, but also of Joseph, his legal father, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 27, that he was of the house of David, were of the line of David. Therefore, legally, not just because God said, well, he's my son, but legally he was of that line. He's of the line of David. And so there the prophecies were fulfilled in this. Now, moving on, he says here, and declared, now, you know, now I like, you know, when you see the to be there, understand that that's italicized, that was added in. 
and declared the Son of God. I like that better. Declared the Son of God. He has declared the Son of God. Interestingly, this word declared comes from a Greek word, H-O-R-I-Z-O, horizo. And it carries the basic idea of marking off boundaries. We get our word horizon from it. Horizon is the demarcation line between the earth and the sky. That's the horizon. It's a definite line. The divine sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ was marked off and absolutely declared in his incarnation. It had been declared, it was a fact already, but it was declared in mankind when he was incarnated and then he evidenced it in his life that he was definitely the divine, eternal Son of God. Various scriptures that we, we look at that deal with that. And there's a, there's a lot of them, but I'm going to give just a few of them and look at these. John chapter 1, verses 32 through 34. John chapter 1, verses 32 through 34. And this deals with the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist Gave testament to this. This is the Son of God. This is the eternal Son of God sent from God the Father to bring salvation to His people, to save His people from their sins, and also to bring in the Holy Spirit to bring this salvation. And when you see the Holy Spirit coming upon Him, He said, then you'll know that this is my Son. Of course, we know John 3.16 First part of that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one-of-a-kind son. He is the only one. In verse 17, the first part, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He sent his son to bring salvation. And then another great passage of scripture where really... What I would say is the coup de grace. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Luke chapter 9, and there in verses 35 and 34 and 35, it says, While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him, the declaration of God the Father himself, that this was his son, that this was the son of God, very God of very God, both man and God, what we call the hypostatic union, all flesh and all God. The divine sonship of Christ marked off in his incarnation seen in these verses of scripture. And it says, then we move on down here, and it says, according to the spirit of holiness. According to the spirit of holiness. Now really another way, and maybe a better way to say that, is according to the nature and work of the Holy Spirit. Now how is that? How, do we, how does that relate to this? Well, let's think about this. Jesus was created in the womb, conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. She knew not a man. She was a virgin. But the Holy Spirit hovered over her, and Jesus was conceived there. He came to be in the flesh by the working of the Holy Spirit. Then, of course, 
As we have seen, we've read of his baptism, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And we are told that he was given the Holy Spirit without measure. In other words, there was no measure of the Holy Spirit in his ministry, in his earthly ministry. And then also he was resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, there in verse 11, the scripture says, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. If you study the context of that, you'll understand that. I believe to be the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit resurrected Christ. So we have the creation basically of the body, the fleshly body of Christ to the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit upon him without measure in his earthly ministry and we have his resurrection by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, he is declared to be the Son of God according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. It is this resurrection from the dead that absolutely declares that this is the Son of God. The Son of God. No one else can attain to that title. Yes, Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he died again. He was a child of God, but he wasn't the Son of God. But Christ died, was raised, and is sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father at this point in time. It was a resurrection that literally occurred, and as we've already said, was verified by over 500 witnesses, and even by earthly men it was verified. I mean, what more could you want? And in the early ministry of the church, in Acts 13 especially, and uh, a message there in verses 29 through 41, there is the message of the resurrection of Christ. If Christ is not resurrected, then we are yet without hope. But it has been verified over and over and over again that he did rise from the dead. That because of the Spirit who raised him from the dead will also raise us from the dead. But it is declared the Son of God really by the resurrection from the dead. He gave his evidence of being the Son of God by his power over the grave. Look at verse 5. Through him, through him, we have received grace and apostleship. Let's look at that phrase here. By him. All that we have received as the children of God is through Christ. Everything that we have today in the spiritual sense of the word is because of his sacrifice upon the cross. All of the spiritual riches which we have are by him and through him. It is by him that we have received this, you know, that we have received grace. If you look, of course, at Ephesians chapter 1, we could camp out there for a while, but, but you understand what he says there. We have camped out there before, by the way. And in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Of course, and there's a whole litany there, a whole list of blessings which we have in Christ. But all the spiritual blessings that we have are by Him and through Him. We've received, he says here, grace. Grace, charis. Grace, joy, favor, acceptance. I like the definition that I read by one scholar who said he gave the definition of this concerning grace. It is a favor done without expectation of return. Absolute freeness of the loving kindness of God to men. Finding its only motive in the free heartedness of the giver. The unmerited favor of God. Woo! Man, that will almost make you shout. It ought to make us shout. It is a place of rejoicing that by him we have received this grace, this loving kindness freely at his hand, poured out upon us, washed in it, filled with it, overflowing with it. 
try to add works or merit to it. It's not grace any longer. There is no such things of works plus grace. It's either gra it's grace plus nothing. It's all that it is. Salvation, it's all its gifts or the grace uh, are all of the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans chapter 3, there in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's all of grace, all of grace. We've received this through Christ, through his work. And not only that, we have received apostleship. And what does he mean by that? Well, this is the word apostolos. And we've already talked about apostleship before, but there was a different word used for the original apostles. There's a different word used here for us. Now, we're all, as the children of God, sent out, and it means sent out ones. We've already talked about that. We're all sent out ones. As a child of God, you are a sent out one. You've been sent out with the gospel, as a witness, as a testimony. Every one of us that have been redeemed by the, by the blood of the Lamb have been saved for the purpose of going out into the world to be Christ's witnesses, to be his apostolos, and to spread the gospel as was done by the early church. What happened when Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church and they were all scattered? What did it say they did? They all went out preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel. The gospel went out into the world. They fulfilled the office of apostolos there. Didn't make them not preach the gospel. It made them want to just spread it everywhere that they went. And it says there, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Obedience. Obedience is important to the Christian life. Not that obedience buys you entrance into the kingdom, but obedience is going to be found in the lives of God's people. I believe that firmly. I do not believe in a Christianity that, do, it, that, that produces no obedience. There are brands of Christianity that you can find in this world that are preached that basically do not say their obedience is a fruit of that salvation. But Paul says here for we, that as being those that have received grace and apostle, uh, apostleship, we're going to be obedient to the faith, to the revealed will of God, to the revealed will of God, I believe, first of all. You know, I have people sometimes say, well, you know, new Christians, well, what, what am I supposed to do? Well, I say, you what you do. You take the book. Here's the book. Here's what the book says to do. You do the book. It's not like men, when we get buy something new, we try to put it together before we read the instructions. And that's why, you know, in our home, that's what I try to do. My wife, may, she reads all the instructions. As Christians, as new believers, we should read the instructions. The Word of God. When I tell newborn Christians, here are the things that you need to be doing. You need to be reading the Word. You need to be praying. You need to be faithful in your attendance to God's house. And I mean to every service. <laughs> to prayer. To study your Bible study. To the preaching of the Word of God and service in the Lord's house. I believe that those things are the revealed will of God. I think it, that's, you know, that's taught there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Paul said, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. In Romans chapter 15, and there in verse 18. Romans 15 and 18, he says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. In chapter 16 of Romans, in verse 19, he says, For your obedience has become known to all. 
our obedience is a witness and a testimony to all around us. Obedience to the faith is an evidence of our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is to be an obedience in the life of the children of God. And, this is, and see, he's setting a tone here for the book of Romans. What's going on here in the book of Romans, what he's going to teach on. And then he says, among all nations for his name, for the glory of his name. For the glory of his name. If I'm obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, it should make his name known. It should not be lifting me up. It should not be exalting me. I, I, you know, I don't believe in a lot of this recognition of those that are working in the Lord's work. I, I, I believe that we ought to let all the glory go to him. It should not be to the preacher's glory. It shouldn't be to my glory. It shouldn't be to my father's glory or, or whatever you're doing in Faith Baptist Church. It shouldn't be for your glory. If you're doing it for recognition, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Okay? It should be done for his name and for the glory of his name. And he says in verse 6, Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Called. Called. What does that mean? It means exactly what it says. Called. He called. You answered. Those who have been divinely called, those who have been appointed or chosen is what the word means. That's what it means. It's the same word that is used on Romans 8 and 28. Where he says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are what? The called according to his purpose. Same word used. The reason you're here this morning as a child of God is because you got a call. And it was a factual call. It was a call that you answered, but it was a call that you were going to answer. There, but to all who, to those who are the call of Jesus Christ. I've been called by Christ. I answered because he called me. It was an effectual call that he's talking about here, the chosen of Jesus Christ. And in verse 7 he says, To all, and this is really the finality of his greeting here, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God. Now he's, he's talking here to this specific group, although it was not meant just for them. I believe that this letter was meant to be circulated around all the believers in that area. But he was addressing them first. Beloved of God, you're the beloved of God. You've been loved by God, the agape love of God. And this is a word that is not used uh, for the sinners, it's used for the saints. And he says, called saints here. Saints. You're the saints. You know, in the, in the Catholic church, what they, that what they do is, well, to, to attain to sainthood, the, the church has got to appoint you as a saint. Let me tell you something. I've, I'm already a saint. I may not always look saintly or act saintly, but in the eyes of God, I'm a saint positionally. I'm a holy one, and that's what it means, a holy one, a set-apart one. Old Testament, New Testament, when it uses that word, that just means the same thing, that you are set apart, that you are a holy one. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. What does he say here? He says, as obedient children, begin with verse 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Those that have been set apart, those that have been called in holiness, he expects holiness in them. And if I believe this, if holiness is not seen in the life of a professing believer, he's not really a believer. I don't, be I don't believe in carnal Christianity. I'm sorry. Now, can children of God get away from the Lord and backslide for a time and appear carnal? Yes, they can. It's happened probably to all of us that are here this morning. But in time, God will correct that holy one positionally to get them back to the place of holiness practically. He will convict them of that sin. But that is our calling as saints to be holy, 
to live holy lives because he is, he is holy. And he gives this common greeting here to them, to these saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reality of this is, is that it is only the saints that have grace. And it's only the saints that can have, that have grace and that can have peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. He gives the peace that passes all understanding there. Grace to you and peace. And this is the end of the introduction of the book of Romans. And next week, we will begin getting into the meat of the book of Romans. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this great introduction that was written by the Apostle Paul. And Father, we have just only scratched the surface of the great truth that is in this book. Father, we pray that in the coming weeks and months, if Lord willing, uh, you tarry your coming and you choose to give life to us and we're here in your house, we pray that in the coming weeks and months and years that you will show us great things out of this book. We know that there are great things here in this book. And we just pray, Father, that you will increase our understanding that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, of his sonship, of his gospel, and what he expects of us as his children. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. May we stand.